Good evening, good evening, good evening, the Covenant Church. Why don't you stand up to your feet and just join in worship with me?
for our lives. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Oh, come on. We can do better than that. We're talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Praise your name, Father. Thank you, Lord. Well, God is so good and Pastor is out tonight, but we are blessed, blessed, blessed to have Pastor Sean McLeod. I love him so much. I love him so I'm so proud of him. I can't begin to tell you, but let me pray. I'm going to pray a blessing over us right now. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord tonight. I know it's not always easy on Wednesday nights coming from work, but you're here, and you're going to be blessed by being here. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we just come before you with humble hearts, hearts of thanksgiving for your grace and your mercy over our lives, Lord. God, we love you, but we know that our love pales in comparison to the great love that you have for us. I ask God for a thousandfold blessing over the daughters and sons that have gathered here tonight just to be in your presence and to hear your word, Father. Bless the young people that are here. God, bless the old folks of us that are here. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. Be honored and glorified tonight in all that we do and all that we say. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Let's give the Lord another hand Amen. clap of praise. Amen. He's a good God. Amen. Turn around and tell somebody everything is going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. And then you may be seated. I'm not going to tarry tonight because I can't. I'm excited to hear the word. I've known Pastor Sean since he was a preteen. Maybe even younger than that. And I'm so proud of the young man that he is. And his mom and daddy are in the house tonight. Y'all wave your hands, wave at us. We're so glad you're here. And I, I don't blame you for being here one moment. I just want to give you a few announcements. First of all, on Easter Sunday, Easter Sunday is coming up in two Sundays. And there is going to be a mass baptism. We've got a number of people that have signed up, and it's not too late to sign up to be baptized in the precious name of Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday. You can sign up in the lobby, give us a call at the church office, and we'd love to see you baptized in the precious name of Jesus on Easter Sunday on 
Resurrection Sunday. Amen. And next Sunday is, uh, this coming Sunday actually, is Palm Sunday. So you don't want to miss it. Pastor has an amazing sermon for us for Palm Sunday. And on Good Friday, the 29th of May, I'm, I'm sorry, of March, there is going to be a 7 o'clock service right here on Good Friday. Please come. You'll be so blessed. Again, that's Good Friday night at 7 p.m. Please come and join us here at New Covenant Church. And ladies, are you getting excited about our 2024 tea party? All right. Well, we are accepting signups now for people that want to sponsor tables. We're looking for ladies that will, and we have all of the criteria and everything written down for you so you'll know exactly what you need to do. And if you'll sign up out in the lobby, we'll be happy to take your reservation, tell you everything we need to do. It's a really big deal. We have a great time. It's a great time for you to invite your mothers, daughters, sisters, and friends for a great time of celebration. And with all of that said, it's tithe and offering at New Covenant Church. Amen. Amen. And thank you for your giving. And I'm going to pray a blessing over the giving right now before you give. Father, we thank you right now for seed to sow into the kingdom of Almighty God. We thank you, Lord, for the wisdom to manage your, God's money with great care. And, Father, I ask that you bless the giver as they give. Father, we know that we can never outgive you. We can never outdo you, Father. I'm asking you through giving that you meet the needs of your daughters and sons, Father. And we thank you for seed to sow, and we sow it now in the kingdom of God. All glory and honor to you, and may God bless you as you give as our ushers come now to receive your offering. know, but if you don't know, Pastor Sean McLeod is our youth pastor, and he does an amazing job with our youth. Amen. Amen. And he is truly a man of God, and I am so, so proud of this young man. I can't even put it into words. I'm so proud of him. And he's a brand new daddy and all that kind of good stuff. So we're just excited to have Pastor Sean McLeod in the house tonight, bringing the word of God. Amen. 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 I love you so much. Um, so I'm going to be up front with like three things before we get started. Number one, um, I'm not used to using this mic at all. And so uh, if you notice me adjusting it at any point, it's because it feels really weird and I don't know how fast Maz does it. Uh, so I need my hands tonight. So hallelujah. Uh, number two, if I sound kind of funny, he's adjusting it. But uh, last night, I get, anyone like get really bad allergies like during the season? It's like, I think all of America gets bad allergies. Um, I get horrible allergies. So last night I was sitting with Izzy and I was holding my little baby and I get so nervous now because uh, it's like, I don't want to get him sick or anything. And last night I was like, oh Lord, what if I have like COVID or something? I don't have COVID, obviously. Um, and I was like, Lord, the only thing that's going to stop me from preaching tomorrow night is COVID. So please don't let it be COVID. Uh, and it's not, so I'm here, just bad allergies. Uh, so if I sound a little funny, Hallelujah. Third thing. I would say number three. Um, tonight, uh, I am personally excited. Um, I, I want to share a little bit about my heart before I dive into this sermon tonight. Um, and the reason for that is because you're going to walk away tonight thinking one of the three things. You're either going to walk away going, oh, that was cool. That was a lot of fun. Uh, you go home. And you don't even think about it tomorrow. Number one, I'm okay with that. Like, I'm like, all right, if you go home thinking, all right, you know, that was cool, wake up, don't, never think about it again, I'm okay with that. Number two, um, something I'm not so okay with is you, you, you go home and you think I am absolutely crazy. Um, not as cool with that, but, you know, I don't care. But I do care, but I don't care. 
Uh, or number three, you're going to walk away going, um, I'm right there with you, and, and that's what I'm really hoping for tonight, um, because I want, I want to break down what my sermon is going to kind of look like tonight. Um, number one, we're going to talk about something really cool, something I get excited about. And then number two, um, we're going to take a really weird turn in this sermon. Um, and that's where I'm more nervous about. Cool? Y'all with me? Say yes. All right. Thank goodness, man. You guys are like just staring at me. I'm like, you're already thinking I'm crazy. Like, they're like, what is he about to talk about? Give me one second. I told you I'm going to be just in this thing. Sorry, Sean. Okay. We're going to jump into it tonight. Um, on these, on, I kind of got three. If it, it, sections. Section one is awesome. Section two, also awesome. Section three is where everyone's going to go, oh. Um, but a little bit about myself. Um, I've been wanting to be a pastor since I was literally, like my parents can attest to this, that I used to stand on our coffee table like two or three years old uh, telling Bible stories. And so it's kind of always been in my heart. Um, now, I don't consider myself a, um, a heavy dreamer, but I do believe that God speaks in dreams. And I, I've noticed that inside my heart that there are things that I am passionate about, and oftentimes it's the things that you're passionate about that God will call you to. Um, and so I remember uh, just a, a dream I kind of want to share, right? two, two dreams I kind of want to share that I've had. Um, and I think it kind of reflects where my heart is and where this sermon is tonight, is my first dream, um, I had this dream where this whole sanctuary was full and people were just being filled left and right with the Holy Spirit. Um, I remember that in the dream, all I did was this, this, this aisle right here, not the wall aisle, but this aisle, I just walked up and down and someone came up to me and they're like, how on earth did this happen? Why are we experiencing a revival right now? And I remember in my dream, my only response, and then I woke up, was this. Um, some things happen only by prayer and fasting. Um, and so I'm a, a, a huge believer in a revival, and, it, and specifically an end times revival. Um, I don't consider myself an end times preacher, if you've ever heard me preach before, um, and I'm not going to start necessarily tonight. Um, <laughs> but my second dream that I had uh, it was a little bit different, but not so different. This was at a time that just before I took over as youth pastor, um, I had preached, I think, one sermon, and it was not good. Um, and um, I remember one night I had a dream, and in my dream, I was standing on stage preaching, which was not normal for me. And um, in my dream, there were five pastors that were preaching, and it was five minutes each pastor. And one pastor got up, and I remember in my dream, there was this young lady to the right who had a sign with his notes on it. And you know, like, see those tele teleprompters where they, like, take the billboard and they fold it down, and then here's your next, and then they put the next one, and it's like, here's the next notes. And, then, and, and that's what was happening. And I remember the first pastor got up, preached five minutes. Everything was like, okay, nothing happened, got off stage. Next pastor, same thing, read the notes. And I remember that for whatever reason in my dream, I was the last person to go. There's a reason that I'm telling you this story. Um, I remember standing up on, on stage and I got ready to preach. And she had my notes and I got ready to preach it. And I remember in my heart in the dream that something said, no. And I remember turning and preaching what was in the heart, what what biblical, and I remember the, in my dream, I had to step off the stage and onto the corner because people kept bum rushing the stage. And in my dream, I remember old ladies pushing young men out of the way to get to the altar. And I say that, and, and, and the closing of my dream is I remember shouting into the mic, his grace is sufficient for you, his grace is sufficient for you. I said it twice, and I woke up, and that was my dream. And the reason I share that is because my heart is, is for revival. My heart, that everything that comes from my heart, it, I, I'm not saying I believe that I, I, I can start a revival or anything like that, but I'm saying my heart is to see people just wake up to, to who Jesus is, to wake up to the reality of the cross, to wake up and experience an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, to wake up 
That's my heart. Now, there's times that I don't preach my heart. There's times I can come up and I can preach whatever the heck I want to. And it's like, it can be a good sermon. But tonight, I, I, I kind of want to preach a little bit from the heart, if that's okay. So um, I'm not saying we're going to have a revival by the end of this. That would be nice. What I am saying is there will be a response. Um, and so we're going to dive into the word. Um, I want to pray, and then we're going to get started tonight. Jesus, I thank you so much for what you're doing in this place. I pray that you open hearts. Um, I pray that no one thinks I'm a crazy person. And, and I pray, Lord, that we respond to your word um, and that it falls on good soil tonight, Lord Jesus. I pray that we are not like soil that it might grow quickly and, and dissipate really quickly. Uh, and it's not soil that the enemy comes in and snatches, Father. Um, but this is fertile soil. We thank you for your word. I pray that you give us a heart and, uh, for other people and, and a heart for your people um, and for this nation and for this world that you have placed us in for this time uh, where we love you so much and we're so thankful for what you're doing. In the holy name we pray. And everyone said... So we're going to be um, in the book of 2 Kings, um, and I want to tell you a story about this dude. Um, I'm going to let you know right now, this isn't Pastor Maz's whiteboard, so no one stress out throughout the, this night. Uh, we have a lookalike that is the intern's whiteboard. That'll make sense later. Um, so we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 23, and there's this guy named King Josiah that, um, if you know a little bit of Bible history, the 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 Kingdoms were split up into kind of two divisions. There was Judah and there was Israel. King Josiah was one of, but not the last of um, the kings of, of Judah. And what the kings kind of look like is all of Israel's bad kings. Israel, just bad kings. Judah, all right. You know, like there's some kings that were all right. Um, there was a guy named Hezekiah that was a good king. Um, and then what kind of happens is it skips. So it's like good king, bad king, bad king, bad king, good king. Uh, and that's where we're at. It's kind of like good king, which I believe was Hezekiah. It might be someone else. Don't, don't quote me on it. Not important. I mean, it is important, but not right now. Um, good king. So then you get a bad king, a bad king, a bad king. And then you get King Josiah. So this is what King Josiah is growing up in. I don't, I don't know how many people maybe met your great-grandparents. Um, that's what this is kind of equivalent to, is that King Josiah probably didn't meet his great, great granddad who was a good king to teach him about godly things. And so he's coming from a background that it's not necessarily really godly things. What's happening is that the people of Israel are making pacts with other nations, the Canaanites, the, the Jebusites and the termites and all the other ites that are existing in the Bible. And they're taking their gods and their idols and putting them into their temples, which is a no-no. You ever read scripture? You don't do that. And so this is the background of what's happening in 2 Kings. Um, and so that's where we're going to pick up. In, in chapter 23 and verse 4, uh, what happens is that King Josiah has someone cleaning the temple. Upon cleaning the temple, they stumble upon the Bible, or back then it was just the law. The, the first five books of the Bible, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, it was the Torah. And so they stumble upon it. They begin to read it. And King Josiah starts crying because the words that were written in the book, and he starts going, oh my goodness, we're filthy sinners. And then he sends one of his priests, his high priest, to go pray to the Lord and ask him, is this real? Because if it is, we need to change some stuff. And so he goes, he prays, he comes back to the king and says, yeah, it's real and we're in trouble. But don't worry, the Lord heard you and he said, he's not gonna kill us and wipe us out until after you're dead. So good job, Josiah. <laughs> you know, uh, name your kid Josiah, good job. Um, so that's, this is where we're kind of picking up. And so this is what it says in verse four of chapter 23. It says, then the king instructed Hilkai, the high priest and the priests of the second rank and the, the, the temple gatekeepers to remove from the Lord's temple all of the articles that were used to worship Baal, Ashtoreth, and all of the powers of heaven. The king had all of these things burned 
outside of Jerusalem on the terraces of the Kidron Valley, and he carried away the ashes to Bethel. He did away with the idolatrous priests who had appointed, who were appointed by the previous kings of Judah, for they had offered sacrifices at pagan shrines and throughout Judah, um, and even in the vicinity of Jerusalem. They had also offered sacrifices to Baal and to the sun and to the moon and to the constellations and to the powers of the heavens. The king removes all of these things in the Asherah pole from the Lord's temple. And he took it outside of Jerusalem to the Kidron Valley where he burned it. Then um, he ground up the ashes from the pole and of the dust and threw it onto the graves of the people. He also tore down the living quarters of the male and the female pro, uh, shrine prostitutes that were inside the temple of the Lord where the, the, the women wove coverings for the Asherah pole. We're gonna skip down to verse 21. Um, this is what's really cool. Um, is that after King Josiah does all this stuff, this is what he does. King Josiah then issued this order to all of the people. You must celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as required in the book of the covenant. There had not been a Passover celebration like that since the time when the judges ruled in Israel, nor throughout all the years of the kings of Israel and Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah's reign, the Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. Josiah also got rid of all of the mediums, the psychics, the household gods, and idols, and every other kind of um, detestable practice, both in Jerusalem and throughout the land of Judah. He did this in obedience to the laws written in the scroll that Hilkiah, the priest, had found in the Lord's temple. Um, if you're taking notes tonight, um, the title of my sermon is called The Valley, The Lamb, and the great outpouring. Don't read too much into that title or you will be confused by the end of it because it doesn't look confusing, but when we get to number three, you're gonna be confused. So the valley, such a cool graphic, made it myself. The lamb, and this is kind of the three parts that I wanna talk about. So when we get to the valley and then the lamb, you're gonna be like, this is awesome. And then we're gonna get to the great outpouring and that's where I'm gonna lose you all. Um, Hopefully not in the name of Jesus. Um, But that's where the fun stuff is going to start. So, I believe when you're reading Scripture and reading with intentions, right? When you read the Bible, you read with intention. Um, If I were to talk about this Scripture that we just read, is there anything that sticks out to you? I mean, you're probably like, yeah, there was a lot of stuff that could stick out to me. Well, there's one thing that I want to talk about that stuck out to me. And a lot of this came from my dad. I was having a conversation with him and he started talking about this and I was like, no way, this is so cool. Like you start just reading something in the Bible and you're like, this is the coolest thing. I need to slow down because I was talking way too fast. Um, You read some stuff in the Bible and you're like, this is cool. I wanna do some more research. That's what this was like. Uh, My dad started talking to me about it and I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever heard. Like I wanna get some research. And so that's where we're gonna go into some of the research This is cool. So what happens is in this story, King Josiah takes the idols, he he burns them down, and then he throws them into this place called the Kindred Valley. Now, maybe you're like, like I talked to Pastor, I was walking in Pastor Matt's office, I was like, did you know about this? This is like the coolest thing I've ever heard. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I know all about that. So maybe you're there. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're like, I've got no idea what you're talking about. Wherever you're coming from, There's some good stuff tonight. Cool? Amen? So there's this place called the Kidron Valley. Was that something that stuck out to you in this whole story? Probably, like, I mean, we can often skip places in the Bible. Um, I am not a geography guy. Like, I like history. Geography, I am horrible at. But this place called, you know, In in scripture, it it has other terms and other names. Uh, One term is called the Brook Kidron. Um, Another term is called uh, the Valley of Jehoshaphat that you would read about in the book of Joel. Um, This is a place like, it's kind of a cool place in scripture. Um, And so what King Josiah does is he takes down the idols, he throws it there. I mean, when, when King David's running from Absalom, he crosses the Kidron Valley. We're gonna talk about some of this stuff. 
in the book of Revelations and Ezekiel, this place shows up. In Joel, it's an end time judgment. In Revelations and Ezekiel, it's a spring of life. Like this valley has some crazy stuff to it. Are you with me so far? Like, this is kind of neat. Like, what's going on? Um, some people that, you know, um, King Hezekiah and, and King Asa also threw idols into the Kidron Valley. Um, there, back then, there were multiple people probably buried in it, according to what we just read. But some important people would be King Absalom was buried in it. And, and Zechariah is also buried here, but but this isn't even the coolest part about the valley. Now, these, these are cool things. Like, when you start realizing the Lord talks about end time stuff with this valley, like, if you want a picture of what the, where this valley is, you get Jerusalem. There's the Kidron Valley, and then there's the Mount of Olives. So, the Mount of Olives overlooks the Kidron Valley. There's some scholars, don't, don't, Check me on this, uh, but there's some scholars that believe that when Satan tempted Jesus, that he took him to the Mount of Olives, which overlooked the Kidron Valley. So there's some cool stuff about this this valley, and 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 really, it, it's it's not really a river; it, it's more like a, a small stream. And this is what I, what I want to talk about: that this stream today is is a place where a lot of the garbage from Israel will go, or waste will end up in. And so there was a, a couple years back, there was, um, they were trying to clean up the Kidron Valley. It's kind of neat. But I want to show you something really cool. In the book of Ezekiel, this is where we're going to be for a moment. And then we're going to kind of shift gears. That in Ezekiel 47, I, I want to read this to you. And I want to kind of give you a new idea about this. Are you with me? Say yes. It says this in verse one, in my vision, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There, I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple and passing to the right of the altar on the south side. The man brought me outside the wall through the north, the, the north gateway, and he led me around to the eastern entrance. Some of you guys might already know this uh, passage of scripture. It's pretty popular. There, I could see water flowing from out the south side um, the south side of the east gateway. Measuring as he went, he took me along the stream. And and this is where he kind of says, we went a little bit ankle deep and then we go way steep. Uh, In verse five, it says, we measured another 1,750 feet and the river was too deep to even walk across. It was deep enough to swim in, but too deep to walk through. And I I think like you hear a lot of sermons, you're like, how deep are you gonna go with the Lord? Like this is kind of where we go with it. I wanna kind of change a little bit of, of your perspective with this passage of scripture because it blows my mind. And in verse six, it says, he asked me, he says, have you been watching son of man? And then he turned me back around, along the riverbank. And when I turned, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing on both sides of the river. Then he said to me, this river flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. The waters of this stream will make salty the waters of the Dead Sea, fresh and pure. There will be swarms of living things. Fish will abound. Fishermen will stand along the shores. All this cool stuff is gonna happen. And in in verse 12, it says, fruit trees of all kinds will grow along both sides of the river. The leaves will, 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 will constantly, they'll never turn brown, like all this cool stuff. And it says that the, 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 the river will flow from the temple and the fruit will be fruit, uh, for food and leaves for healing. Now, this is where things get really cool. I believe in, in, in what's known as dual prophecies, right? Meaning that it happens once, but then it happens again. So in Revelations chapter 22, you start reading it, it sounds like the same story because it's a dual prophecy. But there's another time that this story happens and it unfolds. And this is where the cool stuff starts. What would happen at the temple is each year they they would have Passover. 
We know that Passover is from Exodus. Uh, the Lord tells them, I'm gonna take you out of Egypt. Um, so what I want you to do is I want you to kill a Passover lamb. I want you to take the blood and put it over your doorpost that the Lord's gonna pass over. And if you don't put the blood on the doorpost, your firstborn son is gonna die. Um, and so that they would have to sacrifice a lamb and all this stuff would happen. And so they would begin to do this each year. And now we know crazy stuff is that Jesus is our Passover lamb. And so what ends up happening is when the priests would, would kill the lamb, they would then take the blood of the lamb and in the temple stood drains. And what would happen is that they would pour this blood, you know, first they would sprinkle it on, on, on the mercy seat and all that stuff, but then they would take the blood and they would pour it into the drains of the temple. Now this drainage would go into a, a, a river called Gehenna, which would flow into another one called Kidron. Are you with me so far? So oftentimes this blood would flow into the Kidron Valley. Now here's where I want to really, really, really want to trip you out. In the book of John, chapter 18, Jesus is having his last supper with his disciples. He looks at Judas and he says, what you're about to do, do it quickly. Judas leaves. He, he betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He goes, he gets the guards. Jesus leaves the place of Passover. And verse one of chapter 18, it says that he crossed the Kidron Valley with his disciples and he entered a grove of olive trees, also known as the Garden of Gethsemane. And so Jesus leaves. And so can I paint you a picture for a moment? Please don't, don't, don't think I'm saying this is how it was because I wasn't there. I want to take a little creative liberty, and I'm, I'm not changing the word, but I just want you to picture this for a moment. 30 years later, after Jesus dies, a census went out to count how many lambs were slain at Passover. The census came back that 256,000 lambs, 256,000 with three zeros, lambs, slain. Now, that wasn't long after Jesus. It, it wasn't um, like it was a really long time after Jesus died that all this happens. But let's, let's picture Jesus for a moment on Passover, leaving a room. I don't know what it smelled like. I don't know if you ever smelled blood, but you can kind of smell when it's in the air. Picture 200,000 lambs being slain and their blood being poured into a valley. The smell that as Jesus is crossing a Kidron Valley to go pray, to ask the Lord, Lord, let this cup pass from me. As Jesus is praying, blood sweating from his brow, the smell of blood in the air from lambs being slain. Not, not just that, let's take a little creative liberty. What if as Jesus crossed the valley, blood was being streamed into it? So now we're seeing Jesus leave Jerusalem, walk across a brook that is now full with the blood of lambs as he goes to pray before being sacrificed as the perfect lamb. You see, the Lord's an author. And when he, when he says things in scripture, sometimes we can overlook it. But when we dive into, we begin to see that, man, this author knew what he was doing. That that wasn't an accident. You know, I was watching this story on Instagram um, where this guy was talking. He said, I wish that sometime." Um, Please understand what he was saying. I'll correct what he was saying. He says, sometimes I wish we would read the Bible like it was a fiction novel. Because when you read fiction novels and you start reading and something happens, you take extra notice of it because you know there was an author with intention. 
And so what if when we began to read the scriptures, the word of God, we began to read it like there's an author with intention? Because the word of God is living and active. All scripture is God-breathed. Now things get so much cooler. Let's go back to King David for a moment. King David is running from Absalom. He, in 2 Samuel chapter 15, he crosses the Kidron Valley. He goes up to the Mount of Olives. And at the time he is at the Mount of Olives, he, he gets word that one of his closest advisors betrays him. Let's fast forward to Jesus, crosses the Kidron Valley, steps into the Garden of Gethsemane, where one of his closest friends betray him. Coincidence? I think not. Cool yet? Is your mind blown yet? I told you this is going to be kind of cool. Like Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. So imagine that, that Jesus, God, he steps into the garden knowing exactly what's going to happen. He's reminded by the smell and the sight of it. He knows, look, not long from now, in just a few hours, I am going to die a death. I'm going to be beat, whipped, just like a lamb led to slaughter. And I know exactly what's going to happen. But he knew this must happen. This must happen. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 and 23, it says, In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything is purified with blood, for without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. This is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which are copies of heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals, but the real things in heaven had to be purified by a far better sacrifice than the blood of animals. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it says, for the life is in the blood. Life is in. The, tap the person next to you and say, life's in the blood. Life is in the blood. I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for your life that makes purification possible. Revelations chapter one, verse five and six, I'm kind of skipping half the verse, but it says, all glory to him who loved us and freed us by this, by, from our sins by shedding his blood for us. In verse six, he made us a kingdom of priests for God, all glory and power to him forever and ever. His blood freed us. You know, this is what's kind of cool. You, you get sin, right? You get sin. And and what we don't realize is with sin, just how permanent. Like this is something permanent. This is not coming off. Like like sin was something that was permanent. Like that's a Sharpie. That's why I didn't use Pastor Maz's whiteboard. I didn't want him to kill me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But but sin was something permanent. And so what the Bible's teaching us is that there has to be something that covers this. There has to be something that 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 like like it washes away, you know, I'm not gonna spend all my time, but if I keep doing this, it's gonna get rid of all the sin. And I didn't think that through. Hallelujah. It's really cool if you take a little sharp, like dry erase, it erases it. It's really cool. Uh, but the blood of Jesus is the only thing that can wash away sin. And so there was was a blood that was shed for us, but not just for us. Um, This is where I want to hit into number three, is I, I believe wholeheartedly in a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um. You see, King Josiah had a lot of things going on in his time. And again, not many people before him were holy people. And and so let's paint a picture of what King Josiah is going through. He's going through a lot of stuff that he's used to. King Josiah is seeing a lot of things that would probably make a grown man blush. 
because the culture that King Josiah was living in, the culture that King Josiah was growing up in, that, that his grandfather, his father, the Bible says, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so he reads a passage of scripture. I don't know what he read. Maybe, maybe it was Exodus chapter 34. It says this, be very careful. Uh, in verse 12, be very careful. The Lord's warning him, be careful. Be careful that you never make a treaty with the people who live in the land where you're going. For if you do, you will follow their evil ways and you'll be trapped. Instead, instead, this is what it says you must do. Verse 13, you must break down their pagan altars, smash their sacred pillars, and cut down their Asherah poles. You must not worship no other gods before the Lord, whose very name is Jealous, for he is a God who is jealous about his relationship with you. You must not make a treaty of any kind with the people living in the land. They lust after their gods, offering sacrifices to them. They will invite you to join them. Verse 16, then you'll accept their daughters who sacrifice to other gods as wives, and they will seduce your sons to commit adultery against me by worshiping other gods. You see, King Josiah realizes something so important when he begins to read the word of God and he begins to read scripture. He begins to say, oh my goodness, we've made covenants with things the Lord made us, told us not to make covenants with, that we came in relationship with, that we made treaties with, how do we know we're in covenant with it? Because the Asherah poles in the temple. How do we know we're in covenant with it? Because Bel is standing in, in the place where God should stand. How do we know that, that, that some things have taken its place? And here's the reality of, uh, of all this. It's now the year 2024. 20, how to think about that. But the reality is we're still in covenant with a lot of these things. This is where I'll, I really pay attention. You either think I'm crazy or, or, or we're gonna really experience what the Lord wants to do tonight because my role is not to tell you what, what end times, what's coming next. My goal is to look at what's happening right now because I work with young people every single week and can I tell you, young people every single week are dealing with the same things that King Josiah had to deal with. That I'm walking and I'm teaching and I'm talking and, and, and I began to write things down that the things that King Josiah steps in, tears down, are the very things that we're dealing with today. And so what I want to talk about is I want to point it out and then I want to talk about our response to it. Because our response to it is what will give an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Our response to what's going on, we worship Baal, and, and we, we've set up Asherah poles. We, 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 we sacrifice to Malek. These are things that, that were happening. Um, I mean, there was, there was this video that Pastor Maz played a couple weeks ago where they were talking about Christian nationalists. And, and, and it blew my mind because it, this lady goes, Christian nationalists, not Christians. Don't get confused with Christians. Christian nationalists, what's a Christian nationalist? Someone who disagrees with same-sex marriage and abortion. No, no, I think you're confused that that's not a Christian nationalist, that's a Christian. So you're saying that a Christian is someone who's tolerant. And so I'm listening to this, and then she says something else that blows my mind. She says um, that, that, that Christian nationalists believe that the word of God was given to man, men specifically, and that's what we're seeing in today's culture, that there's an attack on manhood and masculinity. Where does all this coming from? And that's what I want to talk about for a moment. Because what's, what's happening and the reality of things is things weren't just idols. They were spirits and they were demons. And so you start seeing influence over cultures that, that the Lord's saying, look, don't coven covenant with the Canaanite. Why? Because there's some spirits that Canaanites playing with that I don't want my people to play with. And what's happened is that Jesus, through the blood, has, has given us a new covenant. But what's happening is that we're taking his covenant and other covenants. 
and I'm coming in covenant. Oh, we can come in covenant with the blood of Jesus, but we, we can also worship. And so what's happening is that we're seeing that Christians are slowly operating in things of other worships. Are you okay so far? And so I want to specifically talk about, just for a moment, Baal and Asherah specifically. Because I believe that these two demons are still at work even in our world today. And now it just might be a different name, a different term. They would often appear, Baal being a male and Asher a female, but let's be honest, they're, they're spirits. They don't have gender. And the role was to take someone who was created in the image of God and conform them to their image. That is the role of, 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 of a demon is to take what one image, the image of God, and convert. Why? Because what God creates, Satan counterfeits. And so there's a lot of counterfeits that have been happening. And what we begin to need to begin to realize is that even gender is a spiritual warfare. That, that it's... It, it, why? Because we're not just looking at history, but we're looking at history and spiritual history. We're looking at history and what was the spirits behind it. Not like, why did the Canaanites keep attacking Israel? Because there were spirits behind it. And if we're not careful, what, what, can, what can happen is that we can keep replacing a person in an office, but we don't replace the spirit behind it and nothing ends up changing so let's talk about Baal just for a moment. What is Baal? What does he represent? Because this is like, like whenever you see God, you often see Baal. That is, when, when, when people leave God, they often go to Baal. And it is the same thing that is still happening today. Baal would rule cities, towns, and nations. He represented prosperity, fertility, um, he, he represented comfort and success. I mean, the first, one of the first times you see Baal, and it doesn't flat out say Baal, is that Moses is standing on the mountain and he's getting the Ten Commandments from the Lord. And then he comes down from the mountain. All of a sudden, all of the people of Israel have created a golden calf, which is a baby bull. They take it, what, and, 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 and that, this was the first Baal that Israel ever came in contact with because Baal is often described as a bull. Not just that, it was the success that it was made out of gold. You know, it, it might be new days, but it's old demons. And this is what we see even in our world today is that there is a lure of success, a desire to succeed to, to be wealthy, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with money, but I'm saying what, what's behind that desire? And does that desire trump Jesus? Does it trump God? Does it trump the Holy Spirit? It, is this desire, why? Because maybe there's a bail present. Can we go just a little bit deeper? There was another one known as Asherah. There are other terms outside of the Bible as Ishtar or Venus or other terms and names, Aphrodite. This was, this was often a queen and, and at times you would see it married to Baal. And there's even religions that believe that God divorced Ishtar or that, that Yahweh divorced her. None of that's true. It is a demon. And so, Ishtar kind of has four things that, it, that, that she's known for. Number one is she was known as the god of the taverns and of alcohol. The god of addiction or the goddess per se of addiction and that people, that, that oftentimes that she was worshiped in bars and in clubs and what we didn't realize is that when you began to drink, you would welcome other spirits rather than the Holy Spirit. Drugs, 
alcohol a little bit of pleasure for a lot of pain. That, that this is, it, it might be nice at first, but I can't live without it, and slowly it kills you. Number two, she is known as the goddess of prostitution, of making private things public. Uh, it, it, it was um, the price, um, tolerance, gender confusion, sexual experimentation, that, that, that there are sacred hymns to Asherah of old, that some of the oldest hymns. And, and can, I, can I be honest, when you begin to hear today, in today's world, music that is sexual and perverse in nature, it is just worship to Asherah. Her new home has become social media. Can I say that again? Her new home has become social media because what's happening is that we're seeing our young people now sexualized and objectified on social media. And so she has platforms. Number three, it's transgenderism. Are you okay so far? It is, it is known as the, the goddess of love and war, that, that, that there was an entire spectrum of things. It, it was Venus, that, that Ishtar, and all of these things. Hold on, I want to keep going with my notes. Um, when you see men begin to dress like women, you know that there's an influence there. She has a job in schools, in art, in, in, in education systems. It, it's spiritual warfare. You know, there's a, can you, can you hit that first slide? There's, there's an um, ancient Mesopotamian tablet. Um, it's recorded as this, when I, Asherah, sit at the alehouse, I am woman and I am an exuberant young man. And so when you begin to see gender confusion happening in things, it's not the person, it's the spirit. It's not the person, it's the spirit. And as long as you start keep hating the person, you'll never get to the spirit of things. Because our, 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 what does the Bible say? We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers of the unseen places. And as long as there's hate towards a person, there'll never be prayer for a spirit. Number four, she is the goddess of pornography. That, that often she is, she is depicted as sensual, that, that they would have Asherah poles, and we're not going to put up any pictures of an Asherah pole, uh, because it is, it is gross that you would see private parts. And what would happen is that they would set up, because remember, God creates Satan counterfeits, is they, they would set up their idea of a church on a hilltop where people can see it. And what they would do is they would begin to make music, they would offer alcohol, and outside they would sit in Asherah pole, whereas if anyone looked at it, they, like if you had a one-story house and you looked up on the hill, you knew what was going on. We don't even realize that, that like, like listen to this just for a moment. The word erotic, which means desire, comes from the Greek word eros, which is also or it comes from the word eros, which is the, the, the Greek God who was of sexual desire, born of Aphrodite, and Aphrodite is the Greek name for Asherah. And so the porn industry was created by a demon named Asherah and her offspring known as Eros, which means exotic or sexual desire. And the role is to do exactly what she set out to do. It is pleasure. And along with Baal, there is pleasure and wealth. Her artwork is often um, pornographic in nature. The poems and songs, they're all graphic. And, and I want to tell you how this would work. And then don't worry, I'm not going to be graphic. Or, but what would happen is that at these buildings, it, 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 was, it was a whole bunch of things. It, it was, um, forgive me for this, it, it was a bar, it was a strip club, it was a brothel, and it was an abortion clinic. It is what these churches were. 
And they would go, they would worship, they would get drunk, and they would do bad things while the band played. And if you got pregnant, here's what would happen. If you had the child and you didn't want them because it got in the way of the worship of Baal, of success, and of pleasure and freedom, are you with me? You would hand them to the priests who would sacrifice them to a demon named Molech. And it's such a counterfeit to what the gospel is that God doesn't ask for our sons. He gives his son. I, I, I mean, can, can we... And, and, and as this would happen, the band would just begin to play louder and louder. Can we play that next slide that I have? It, 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 according to the ancient philosopher Plutarch, it says the whole area before the statue of Molech, the Ammonite demi, uh, demon god mentioned 26 times in the book of Judges, was filled with loud noises and flutes, drums, so that the cries and the wailings would not reach the ears of the people. And I mean, isn't that even today what we hear is that there's people outside chanting so that you don't hear the cries of what's going on inside. Why? New days, old demons. But they would dance, they would drink, while the life would be terminated so that the people wouldn't hear it. Like, we're, we, are, we are living in the days of the kings and of the judges and of the scripture. Proverbs 8.36 says, all who hate me love death. All who hate me love death. Can I, can I show you one more slide? And then I'm getting off this topic and we're going we're gonna to finish up. We're going to wrap up. One, one million self-inflicted death, 1.3 million traffic accidents, 1.6 million HIV AIDS disease, 4.9 million smoking deaths, 8.2 cancer, 12.9 infectious disease for a total of 29.9 million deaths, 44.6 million. That is the leading cause of death globally. King Josiah tears down the poles, the altars, the shrines, the images of all of these idols. And I believe that um, what we're going to end tonight is I want to end on a passage of scripture as a response because I believe that, that this isn't just hopeless stuff that I'm spitting out and saying, here's the world, it sucks, I'm getting out of here tonight. No, no, there's a response from the people of God. And the response is spiritual warfare. And so there's, there's two things that I believe the people of God need to do that are found in the Bible and in Joel and that we see that happens from, from King Josiah to Elijah to Moses, to Hezekiah, to Nehemiah, to Daniel, the, the same response. And the response number one is that the men of God need to take their place. The men of God need to take their place. In the book of, of Joel, it says that, in chapter one, it says that the locusts came, the nations came, and that's exactly what's happening is that the nations are roaring. The nations are roaring. They're at war. But I believe that it, it starts because here's the reality. We, we see Josiah, like, like where, like, I, I want to ask, like, where's the Josiahs, the, the Elijahs who stand against Jezebel and says, look, 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 we're, I mean, that's exactly who was, he said, the prophets of Baal, you do your thing. I'm going to call fire down from heaven from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is who they were against. He goes against Jezebel. Where's the Elijahs? I mean, let's be honest. We see a lot of Deborahs, but not a lot of Moseses. We don't see a lot. So there needs to be men. Because when you go into rooms where, where intercession's happening and spiritual warfare is happening, it's often women and not a lot of men. We can't be like Adam who was tolerant and stood by and was passive as Eve ate the fruit and then he hides from God 
And the Lord went, says, Adam, where are you? Let's take responsibility. And Adam was nowhere to be found. Are the men, when, it time, when it's time for responsibility, to take action? Where are the men? Number one, men need to take their place. And number two, in the book of Joel, chapter two, verse 12, it says, now therefore says the Lord, turn to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful, so slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. He knows if he, if, 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 he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind, a grain offering. For, okay, skip that part. Uh, great part. Verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred, that's you, call a sacred assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, the nursing babies, let the bridegroom uh, go from his chambers and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priests let the priests who minister, that's you. You are a royal priesthood. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare your people. Spare your people and do not give your heritage to reproach the nations that they should rule over them that they should say, where is your God? Well, look, I'm not telling you that you need to repent tonight. That is not my sermon. My sermon is this. There is an intercession that needs to happen because the repentance wasn't for the priests. The repentance was for the nation. That when the people of God begin to re repent on behalf of, it says, let the priests stand before the porch, the people, and the altar and make intercessions. There needs to be intercession that happens. Can I tell you, the Bible is full of people that interceded on behalf of a nation and God heard. Daniel chapter nine says that Moses, uh, Daniel said, Lord, forgive our nation. This is one man praying. And the, the Bible says that the moment you started praying, the Lord answered and started moving. Paraphrasing a little bit roundabout what it says. And then in chapter 10, it says, like Daniel, I'm listening. Moses stands and he, he says, Lord, please don't destroy us. And Lord resists and he just destroys some of them. Hezekiah prays and says, Lord, like have mercy and the Lord relents. Nehemiah, oh, I love Nehemiah. He sees the sin of the people that they're making covenants and they're making treaties with other nations and other people. And the Bible says that he went to the center of the town. He gets on his knees and he begins to weep and says, Lord, forgive us of our sins. And the Bible says that the whole nation began to surround Nehemiah in repentance. Where are the intercessors? Where are the people? Can, can, can we, just for a moment, where are the people? Because this, is, this, is, this was the commandment that, that God gave Israel. God gave Israel a command, honor the Passover. And here's my question. Where are the people that stand at the doors that have been open to some things in a nation? Doors that have been open in your family? Can we be honest that maybe Baal has taken place in, in your family or in your house or that Asterisk has taken place in your family or your house and the doors that have been open? Intercession is this, that you take the blood. You take the blood and you begin to plead the blood over your family. I'm pleading the blood over our nation. I'm pleading the blood over the people. I'm pleading the blood. Why? Because this, this is, there's power in the blood. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, it says that we overcome him. Who's him? The enemy, the devil. By what? The blood. 
the blood of the Lamb, and the words of our testimony that we overcome. And I wonder tonight, is there some people in this room that's willing to plead the blood? To plead the blood over a nation and say, Lord, forgive us. Lord, like, look what, like, we know, Lord, you see it. We, we, we know that you see the sins of our people. We know, we know. It's time to make war. It's time to make war. Men, it's time to make war for your wives and your kids and your families and your schools and, and your presidents and, and whatever it may be. It's time to make war. Romans chapter 8, verse 34, it says, Who is he that condemns? Who is he that condemns? I want you to read this passage of scripture. This, this is, will blow your mind. It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen. He, Jesus, is at the right hand of God making intercession for us. He's making intercession. Can I simplify that? He's praying for you. And now our response is to pray. And I want to show you that in closing, here's my last thing. If you, if you make war and pray, there's a promise there's a promise. Here's the promise. Still in the book of Joel, verse 28, and it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Can I say, isn't it funny that the enemy is attacking our sons and daughters? And the Lord's saying, no, it's your sons and daughters that's gonna prophesy. Why? Because if my people who are called by my name and they humble themselves and seek my face and they turn from their ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. If the priests sweep between the porch and the altar for the people, for the babies, for, for the children that cannot pray themselves because of the influence, the promise is if you, then I. If you, then I, and it shall come to pass that, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. You see, can I prophesy to you just for a moment? There is an outpouring. There is an outpouring. There's a lot of people that begin to say, I, I just had to delete Instagram because I got so tired of Christians hating Christians. And it's like my whole feed is Christians disagreeing with other Christians and hating on other Christians. And I hate it. And, and the biggest debate is there's no rapture. There is a rapture. People say there's no rapture and there's no outpouring. And I'm like, well, then why am I here? <laughs> so I want the Lord, his spirit to move upon a nation. I want to see sons and daughters dream and prophesy. I want to see old men and old women begin to speak and prophesy and have visions and revelations. But if you, then I. Let's all stand tonight. I hope I didn't scare you off tonight. It's just something that's kind of been really heavy on my heart. 
And when I say, man, I, I believe in a revival, I believe in the, whole, in the Holy Spirit moving and breathing. And, and I, it's even right here in this room. Like, I get a really good view of everyone's backside from the back booth over there. And I can see that there's some people in here that they want it just as bad as I do. There's some people that you want it. But tonight, that's why I said I'm not necessarily here for an outpouring. I'm here for Lord. Spare your people. Spare your children. Can we pray? Let's 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 get really specific right now, just for a moment. Can we pray for humble? Can we lift up our voice for Kingwood just for a moment? Here's what I want to do. If we can just raise our hands all over the room. I don't want to pray. I want it, I want it to be close to home tonight. I'm going to pray, but as I pray, what I want you to do is I want you to begin to pray over the city that you live in. And if you live in Humble, pray for Humble. If you live in Kingwood, pray for Kingwood. If you live in Timbuktu, pray for Timbuktu. If you live in Huffman, pray for Huffman. And I just want you to lift that city up right now. Holy Spirit, just begin to speak to us right now. Come on, let's begin to intercede for those cities right now, the cities that are so close that we see um, crime and we, we see hurt, we see murder, we see um, um, our school systems. Father, we, we, we come before you right now in the precious name of Jesus and we begin to plead the blood over our families, over Humble, over Kingwood and Porter and New Caney in spring in Houston. Father, we thank you right now that you are going before us. And I pray, Lord, that all of the prophecies about us experiencing and outpouring inside of Houston, Father, we thank you right now for what you're about to do. We thank you that you're going before us and that you're opening the floodgates of heaven over this city. We, we ask, Forgive us, forgive Humble, forgive Kingwood, forgive Porter. Lord, I pray that we experience rivers of living water, that the Dead Sea of this area comes to life, and that from here on we begin to see we begin to see a move of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, that, that right now, the people that you have called to intercede, that there, there's intercessors in this room. Lord, I pray that those that, that, that have a calling to be an intercessor and to intercede, to stand in the gap of, Lord, I pray that you put a boldness in their heart right now, Jesus, that if they haven't been interceding like they know they've should have, I pray, first of all, Lord, no condemnation, but Lord, I pray that now is the time. Now is the time to start interceding, to pray for, to pray for new covenant and, and, and for our schools and our children and our families. Lord, thank you. Lord, I pray that I pray that um, tonight that you begin to keep some people awake and they don't come back hating me on Sunday for saying that but I pray that you keep some people awake with bur being burdened feeling the weight Lord, I pray that there's people in here tonight that just begin to feel the weight of your heart for people. The weight uh, for New Covenant Church. The weight for some families. The weight of some sin. Lord, I pray that even as I speak right now, Lord, there's, there's people that just feel that weight even right now. The weightiness of what I'm saying, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Jesus. We're going to go ahead and dismiss right now, but what I'm going to do is um, we're just going to have the band play because I, I still feel like there's some people in here that, that you still want to pray maybe a little bit longer. So I want to be respectful of that. Um, if you have to leave, I'm going to leave this place a place of worship. We're going to dim the lights just a little bit. We're just going to pray, and, and you're welcome to stay as long as you want to pray, but may the Lord bless you. And, and then I pray that you drive safe tonight. In Jesus' name.
Just worship Him. Just worship Him. Just worship Him. Right now we just worship Him. We worship Him, Jesus.
Yeah. 